thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Mark Belsky. Dr. Belsky is the William E. Sne Endowed Chair, Vice Chairman of Clinical Affairs, Chief Multidisciplinary Spine Tumor Service of the Memorial Sloan Catherine's Cancer Center at New York City. Today, Professor Bielski is going to talk to us about minimal access surgery for metastatic spine tumors. Is less actually more? Please type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them at the end of Dr. Bielski's presentation. Welcome, Dr. Bielski. Thank you for sharing your time with us. The microphone is all yours. Thank you very much for the invitation, the opportunity to present this. This may be a little bit similar to a talk I've given before for the society, but I promise if invited again, I'll give a completely different talk, but hopefully this will be very meaningful. 20% of cancer patients will develop spine metastases over the course of their illness. We've seen an increased number of metastatic spine tumors as MR, FDG period of improved detection, but also the systemic treatments have improved survival, but these new biologics and checkpoint inhibitors are much more effective for visceral than for bone disease. So we think we're gonna see a continued uptick in the number of tumors that we're responsible for. Despite this improved survival, the goal of therapy for metastatic tumors is palliative. We wanna improve or maintain neurologic function, achieve local tumor control, mechanical stability, pain relief, and ultimately improve quality of life. And if we accomplish this patient with a thoracolumbar burst fracture that was fixed at our institution, followed by radiation, who's doing this 100 mile paddle on the Allagash River, we have completely obtained that goal versus this patient who has a radiation recall burn injury on the back and failed fixation that ultimately required extension of his hardware and this free flap reconstruction, both of which in the metastatic population are really a disaster and do not by any stretch meet the goals. And much of what we've done over the past several decades is trying to make sure that this uh, is really a never event, that these patients get uh, effective palliation without significant morbidity. Far and away, the single greatest advance in the treatment of metastatic spine disease has not really been surgical, but stereotactic radiosurgery. It's defined as high dose per fraction conformal radiation, typically given a 16 to 24 grade single fraction or eight to 10 grade times three fractions. Compared to conventional external beam radiation, which is usually given as three grade times 10 fractions, Radio surgery obviously has a shorter treatment time, but you can actually give a cytotoxic ablative tumoral dose. And that fundamentally changed our treatment paradigms, including the indications for and type of surgery that we do. There have been major advances in radio surgery, including technological, defining tumorcidal doses and dose constraints for organs at risk, and even defining the radiobiology of radio surgery. In terms of the advances in radio surgery, both non-invasive immobilization and ISO center verification using cone beam CT have been major, but the really big advance has been the development of these conformal photon beam delivery systems, all of which can give very high doses within millimeters of the spinal cord, often within 10 to 15 minutes, even for big complicated tumors. I think radio surgery impact is really shown in the numbers of our multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary spine tumor center where the radio surgery numbers have continued to increase year by year. In 2019, we treated almost 2,400 targets, which was an 80% increase over what we had done only two years earlier. Our surgical volume continued to increase, but what we traditionally think of as surgery for metastatic disease, that epidural decompression actually was significantly less based on being more aggressive with radio surgery. Uh, we are making that up with other uh, uh, procedures such as percutaneous pedicle screws for instability that don't need a decompression. But ultimately that really classic surgery that you do for epidural decompression for neurologic salvage and stabilize the spine represents only 5% of the treatments that we do for the metastatic spine population. Here's a typical case example of a 66 year old male with a history of renal cell carcinoma. He has this biologic back pain, night or morning pain that resolves over the course of the day and denotes simply tumor being there with no mechanical component, but it was severe, it was eight out of 10. He had a acute onset of weakness, less than three out of five in the lower extremities, had other medical issues, chronic renal insufficiency, systemic workup showed renal cell extending into the renal vein and pulmonary nodules. And you can see this really high grade circumferential epidural disease at T10. I think when you look at a patient like that, it's a really complicated scenario. And what we did many years ago was tried to pull out the four sentinel decision points that we make on every patient to make best decisions about therapy. And that became known as the GNOMES framework, 
neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability, and systemic disease to decide best treatment. The neurologic and oncologic considerations are made in combination. And from a neurologic perspective, we're very concerned about myelopathy and functional radiculopathy, but much of the decision making is made based on the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. And a scoring system has been validated where zero is bone only. One A, B, and C are different degrees of epidural impringement without spinal cord compression. Grade two is spinal cord compression, but CSFs is still seen. And three is spinal cord compression, no CSF seen. At least traditionally, the twos and threes have been considered high grade cord compression. From an oncologic perspective, what we're really talking about is how we achieve local tumor control. And tumor control, at least to us, is completely predicated on radio sensitivity. And radio sensitivity has been completely redefined as we've transitioned from conventional external beam radiation to stereotactic radio surgery, as we'll talk about uh, uh, over the course of this lecture. Uh, we also have brachytherapy. We have P32 plaques to clear dural margins and high dose rate of radium after loaded catheters for recurrent bone disease. The separate assessment from neurologic and oncologic is mechanical instability because no amount of radiation will stabilize an unstable spine. The SINS criteria was developed to define instability in the neoplastic setting. There are six components to the SINS score, all of which are weighted by their contribution to instability. Location, junctional, and mobile spine have a higher point score than semi-rigid or rigid spine. The pain, yes, is movement-related pain versus non-mechanical biologic pain gets a one. Bone lesions are classified as lytic mixed or blastic. Alignment, subluxation, translation has the highest point score. Vertebral body degree of collapse or involvement and posterior elements, bilateral, unilateral, or none. Since zero to six is stable, seven to 12 potentially unstable and greater than 13 unstable. And once instability is defined, even the seven to 12 or greater than 13 category, patients are often candidates for kyphovertebroplasty, percutaneous pedicle screws, or occasionally open surgery. And finally, one has to take into account the systemic disease and medical comorbidities. Survival is often used as a determinant to decide whether a patient is a candidate for either surgery or radiation. To the day almost, we knew what the survivals would be with chemotherapy, and then we entered the era of biologics and checkpoint inhibitors that extended survival for virtually every tumor histology. Here with melanoma, a single checkpoint inhibitor in Nivolumab more than tripled the survival compared to chemotherapy, and there are eight or 10 other biologics and checkpoint inhibitors that are equally as effective for melanoma as they are for other histologies as well. And so it was very difficult to try to decide in the era again, when these biologic and checkpoint inhibitors came in about what the survival would be and what the impact would be on our decision about whether we could take somebody meaningfully to surgery. Um, there were old uh, predictive models, such as Tamita and Takahashi scores, which really were developed pre-biologic uh, and checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and now there are other nomograms, which I'll show you in a little bit, that have been developed uh, really to define uh, survival in this patient population. What is really interesting as well in terms of looking at systemic disease and medical morbidity's impact on survival is the treatment of oligometastatic disease, which is one to five uh, metastases. And it turns out that if you give local radiation an ablative dose of radiation, you can actually impact survival. Here's a same of a common trial. It was a prospective randomized trial in Europe that looked at patients with one to five metastases treating all of those sites of disease with either conventional external beam radiation or stereotactic radio surgery plus best systemic therapy. And when you gave an ablative dose of radiation from one to five uh, sites of disease, there was an, a survival advantage. So this local radiation now becomes part of survival in this patient population. Here's the PISA trial that we did at Memorial Sloan Kettering that was run by Mike Zaleski. This was a bone only trial, again, giving either an ablative dose of radiation, in this case, 24 single fraction, versus a high dose hypofractionated regimen, not 27 gray and three fractions. And it turns out that if you gave an ablative dose of radiation, there was better local control, but there was also a decrease in distant metastases, which again may extend to overall survival. And so we think again, this local radiation that we're trying to give for uh, local disease control may actually impact not only local disease control, but overall survival. Here's the other very interesting thing is a combination of checkpoint inhibitors and radiosurgery. So here's a patient that was chronically 
on ipilimumab had melanoma metastases all over the chest that were relatively stable or slowly growing, and then had a single site of disease at the spine that was treated to 24 gray single fraction. And what you saw after that was that all of this distant disease from the site of radiation uh, started to involute and disappear. And that's called the obscopal effect where you give local radiation and get a systemic disease response. And it's a very potent that when you give radiosurgery, you probably create an antigen sink. And then these T cells that are immunized against the tumor are really uh, enhanced uh, their cytotoxic T cell effect in combination with these checkpoint inhibitors. And we think we see this about 20% of the time. Again, we're giving local radiation, but impacting systemic disease control. Why do we need the GNOMES framework? Because 20% because of patients with cancer will develop uh, spine metastases. And if you're in a big cancer center, in a single week, uh, we either treated or evaluated 62 metastases. And so it's very um, useful to have an algorithm or a framework that you can use that you can very quickly disposition patients. And it's cross-disciplinary. Radiation oncologists and neurosurgeons or spine surgeons, medical oncologists, all understand the implications of treatment and what those uh, specific treatment uh, modalities are that are impacted by the GNOMES framework. Um, and so, you know, it's just a massive problem. And that's why the framework is very useful to get people on target very quickly. In terms of the neurologic and oncologic assessments, again, from an oncologic perspective, what we're talking about is how we achieve local tumor control, which is completely predicated on radiosensitivity. To conventional external beam radiation, 30 gray and 10 fractions are sensitive and moderately sensitive tumors, the hematologic malignancies, myeloma lymphoma, and then the hormone-driven solid tumors. The remainder of the solid tumors are moderately to highly resistant tumors, including colon, non-small cell lung cancer, thyroid cancer, renal cell carcinoma, most of the sarcomas, and melanoma. And then from a neurologic perspective, again, we care a lot about whether a patient has myelopathy or functional radiculopathy. But what we're principally concerned about is the degree of cord compression by the scoring system. So how do we make decisions? Well, for the sensitive to moderately sensitive tumors, regardless of the degree of spinal cord compression, we're very comfortable putting those patients on high-dose steroids and a rating 30 gray and 10 fractions with the expectation that the tumor will apoptose and decompress the spinal cord in a timely fashion. The exception to that rule are patients with moderately sensitive breast and prostate with high-grade cord compression and myelopathy. Once they develop myelopathy, you can't decompress them quickly enough with conventional external beam radiation. So for prostate and breast with myelopathy, we will often take them for upfront surgery and then follow it up with either conventional external beam radiation or radiosurgery. For moderately to highly resistant tumors with bone only or epidural impingement, we've seen very poor responses to conventional external beam radiation. So these patients are typically taken straight to stereotactic radiosurgery, either 24 gray single fraction or 24 to 30 gray in three fractions. And finally, for patients with high grade cord compression with moderately to highly resistant tumors, we can't conform the beams plainly enough to spare spinal cord tolerance. So typically these patients and traditionally have been taken for separation surgery followed by radiosurgery. It turns out that with hypofractionated radiation, this 20 to 43, 30, 24 to 30 gray in three fractions, we're pretty able to treat now the grade two spinal cord compression where we still see CSF, and I'll show you this data in a minute, but that really leaves only the grade threes, high grade cord compression with radio resistant tumor for separation surgery followed by radio surgery. One word about myelopathy, if a patient comes into the emergency room or the clinic who is myelopathic, it is really incumbent to get them to treatment, whether that's a radiosensitive tumor that you're gonna to take to radiation or to surgery for a radioresistant tumor uh, as quickly as possible. And the reason for that is that oftentimes when patients come in and they're really minimally symptomatic, four out of five in the lower extremities or, or perhaps even three out of five in the lower extremities, instead of going down this really gradual decline over weeks to months, they often will do this over days, even on high dose steroids, they'll fall straight off the cliff and be a D or a C one day, and then within two to three days, they're in Asia A and paralyzed. And so once you determine that they're myelopathic, there really should not be a significant delay. You need to make sure they're medically safe to go to surgery, but realistically, we do not wait for a diagnosis. If it ends up being myeloma and you take them to surgery, it's the right call because you got them out of neurologic trouble. You did a really simple separation surgery or surgery to get them out of trouble. 
um, to, to salvage their neurologic function and then get them to, to therapy afterwards. But delaying it to make a diagnosis to see whether it's radiosensitive really doesn't play in somebody's myelopathic because very often while you're waiting for that diagnosis to come back, uh, they're gonna progress neurologically. What do we know about radiosensitivity based on differential tumor histology to conventional external beam radiation? Again, there are radiosensitive tumors the hematologic malignancies, breast and prostate versus radio-resistant tumors, basically the remainder of the solid tumors. For the radiosensitive tumors, we have two-year local control rates of 86%. For radio-resistant tumors, the two-year local control rates are 30%, but the median durable responses in some of these tumor histologies is only three months, which begs the question of whether they're really responding at all to conventional radiation. Here's a patient with multiple myeloma, right? A really radiosensitive tumor, had very high grade cord compression, three levels. Here's the compression at T10. Here's a spinal cord with this massive amount of tumor in the epidural space. We put this patient on high dose steroids, gave him three grade times 10. You can see the tumor completely apoptose, decompressing the spinal cord. And I would argue you can't do better than that with surgery. So for those patients with radiosensitive tumors, where you know the diagnosis, it's reasonable to put them on high dose steroids and give them radiation. But if you're going to do that, admit them to the hospital because there is a small chance that as that tumor begins to destroy apoptose, that it will release inflammatory mediators and they may decompensate. And so you want to have them in the hospital in case that happens, then you may have to go to surgery. The problem is we never see these responses with the radio resistant tumors. And that's why for patients, even with low grade cord compression with radio resistant tumors, we go straight to stereotactic radio surgery. And there's a plethora of data on good outcomes with radio surgery, even for radio resistant tumors. Here's our series from Memorial of a little over 800 tumors treated mostly for radio resistant tumor histologies. Again, with ESCC scores from zero to one C. So no spinal cord compression at a median follow-up of a little over two years. Contours were according to standard guidelines. The prescription dose was 18 to 26 gray single fraction but dose was analyzed as a continuous variable and an optimal cut point was used to establish a low versus high dose cohort. The median dose of planning target volume in the low dose cohort was 16.4 gray, which is a very common dose given for radio surgery. And in our high dose cohort, 22.4 gray. The only significant factor in the incidence of local failure was the dose of radiation. The low dose cohort, we still did very well at a year with only a 5% failure rate. But one of the great successes of cancer treatment is that patients are now living longer. And in that low dose cohort at four years, we had a 20% failure rate. In the high dose cohort, we had less than a 1% chance of failure at a year. Uh, but that response was durable so that at four years, we only had a 2.1% uh, risk of failure. And so we think this high dose rate, especially for durable tumor control, is really an important number. The most important thing to come out of this study was not only the durability of the response, but that it was a histology independent. It didn't matter whether it was myeloma, lymphoma, breast or prostate cancer versus colon non-small cell. You overcame this radio resistance with high dose perfraction radiation. And that changed our treatment paradigms. Uh, here's a patient with a T10 solitary renal cell metastasis, ESCC 1B. If you go by traditional scoring systems, such as Tamita Takahashi, the recommendation would be for on-block resection. Of course, this is uh, massive operating times, lots of blood loss and a lot of incumbent morbidity from the procedure alone. But what they were trying to do in the Tamita score was before they had really uh, um, good effective radiation, they were trying to do the oncology, get tumor control with surgery alone. With the integration of radio surgery, you know, for that same tumor, our treatment time is less than 20 minutes, now less than 10 minutes, no blood loss and 98% tumor control. And so there's been a major shift from really aggressive surgery to just this radio surgery. What's the other benefit of radio surgery, even for solitary metastases, is we know that the median time to progression for renal cell from a solitary metastases uh, at presentation is 11 months. And potentially, again, by treating with radio surgery, we may impact overall survival by decreasing distant metastases. And so there's even more incentive to treat radio with this kind of tumor with radio surgery over on block resection. Much of the past decade has been used to define dose constraints for organs at risk for radio surgery. Uh, the most important dose constraint is obviously to the spinal cord, where at a cord D max, a point goes up to the cord of 14 gray we have less than a 1% chance of creating myelitis. 
but it's really this dose constraint to the spinal cord that prevents us from treating high-grade cord compression. And it's predicated on a number of issues. One is that Mike Lovelock did a dose failure analysis where all tumors that failed received less than 15 gray to a small percentage of the planning target volume. So why we think that 24 gray is an ablative dose of radiation, it also may be that that minimum dose of radiation you give is important. Remember that the core D-max is 14 gray, so that with a 10% per millimeter fall off, either we give a cytotoxic tumoral dose that hurts the spinal cord, or we underdose at the margin of the cord where we need the greatest control. Secondly, the resolution of soft tissue can take months, unlike that myeloma I showed you. So you've got no effective immediate decompression of epidural disease. And finally, Sam Rue in 2010 tried radio surgery for high-grade cord compression. Um, and ultimately, there was a 20% risk of neurologic progression, probably because they were underdosing at the margin of the cord in order to protect uh, the spinal cord from radiation myelitis. And so for decades, we really have put the twos and threes into the category of you need some kind of separation before you treat them. We had a series of patients with grade two compression memorial that really were not candidates for radio surgery. And so we took them not to single fraction radiation, that 24 grade single fraction, but rather to hypofractionated radio surgery, this eight to 10 gray times three to five fractions. Uh, the one year local recurrence free survival was uh, recurrence free survival was 10%, increasing to 22% at two years. The one year cumulative incidence of same level surgery was 6%, increasing to 14% at two years. And so it turns out for those grade twos that we've traditionally treated with separation surgery we probably are gonna give up a little bit of tumor control, but can very effectively treat them with three fraction radiation. Uh, again, giving up maybe about 10% control, but avoiding a surgery that potentially they can't tolerate. The question is whether we'll ever be able to treat grades three without surgery. And there's a lot of things on the horizon that may get us there, although we clearly are not there yet. One is that the technology to deliver this stereotactic radio surgery has improved dramatically with what's called volumetric arc therapy, which may make our ability to conform the beams and dose pain at the margin of the cord better. The second issue is that maybe that core D-max of 14 gray isn't, um, isn't dogma. Maybe there's room to go on that. And MD Anderson did a study looking at core D-max of 16 gray uh, with no uh, toxicity to the spinal cord. And that may get us above that 15 grade D-min that may be important, uh, again, for tumor control. And again, instead of giving single fraction radiation, we can give that hypofractionated regimen to improve the therapeutic window. The next thing on the horizon may be developing radio sensitizers. The combination of VEGF TKIs with radio surgery for renal cell carcinoma, there's very good experimental evidence and some clinical evidence out of Cleveland Clinic that we can actually lower the dose of radiation to 16 gray and still have the same impact that we do at 24 gray. And again, that gets us very close to uh, our, our spinal cord constraint where we may actually be able to give a cytotoxic tumoral dose at the margin of the cord. And the second issue is just like I showed you that scopal effect of a combination of checkpoint inhibitors with radio surgery, it may also augment local tumor control. And here's a patient that had been twice irradiated for renal cell carcinoma of the sacrum with this tumor that massively grew. And Josh Yamada is our radius oncologist who is um, one of the pioneers and geniuses in the development and application of this technology. And he really was not willing to not uh, treat this uh, young woman uh, who had significant pain uh, and loss of bowel and bladder. And, couldn't treat the entire volume to what we would think would be a cytotoxic dose. And so he really suboptimally treated the center core to 27 gray in three fractions, nine gray times three. But the patient had been maintained on two checkpoint inhibitors, Nevo, a PD-1 inhibitor, and ipilimumab, a CTLA-4 inhibitor. And at a month, again, with a dose that comes nowhere near, or a, a, a dose coverage that comes nowhere near treating this tumor, we started to see significant toxicity, uh, um, necrosis in the tumor at a month. And by two months, the DCE image is looking at plasma volume that we uh, rely on to tell us whether there's tumor control in that area basically went stone cold. And so we're seeing this, again, this sort of um, uh, complementary effect of stereotactic radiosurgery surgery in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. 
giving us not only the scopal effect, but augmented local tumor control. And again, that may allow us to treat lower dose radiation at the margin of the cord and still have a major uh, ablative effect on the tumor that we care the most about, which is that that causes epidural compression. To date though, we're not ready to treat high-grade cord compression with radiosurgery radio surgery alone. And for that reason, radio-resistant tumors with high-grade cord compression typically go to surgery followed by radiation therapy. This is largely predicated on the Patchell study published Lancet 2005. It was a prospect of randomized trial of solid tumors looking at high-grade cord compression with myelopathy, but the myelopathy could have simply been biologic back pain by their definition. It's comparing surgery and conventional external beam to conventional external beam radiation alone. And very rightly, they excluded the hematologic malignancy. So this was essentially uh, again, looking at solid tumor radio resistant uh, histologies. In every outcome variable, surgery was better than radiation. And based on that and a number of other studies, the Spine Oncology Study Group made a strong recommendation for patients with high grade cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergo surgical decompression and stabilization, followed by radiation therapy. And the question became what kind of surgery and what kind of radiation? As we started to integrate radio surgery as a post-operative adjuvant, the surgical goals of spinal cord decompression for neurologic salvage and using screw rod systems to provide mechanical stability remain the same. What changed was the oncology and how we achieve local tumor control is really predicated on the radiation response. When we had conventional external beam radiation as a post-operative adjuvant, we often did these maximally cytoreductive surgeries, either gross total resection or potentially on block because we had no faith that the radiation would control the tumor in the post-operative setting. And so we relied on the fact that taking more tumor out would give us better tumor control. With the integration of radio surgery, where we know we can control any tumor histology, maybe the goal should only be to reconstitute the fecal sac to create a better target for the radiation. And that became known as separation surgery. Here's an 86 year old with papillary thyroid cancer, Asia C, with this very high grade cord compression and three level vertebral body disease. And I would submit to you that there is no way to get this patient through a three level front back gross total resection uh, for neurologic salvage. 86 year old is simply not going to tolerate that. And so, what we have done is try to pare it down to the most important aspects of surgery to basically create a better target for radiation. Traditionally in separation surgery, we have done uh, fixation two levels above and below the index level. We take a high speed three millimeter matchstick drill and drill off the bone overlying the spinal canal laminectomy. We take off the superior and inferior facet joint and drill the pedicle flush to the vertebral body. We find normal dural planes and strip the tumor off of the dura circumferentially. Typically we will spare the nerve roots, although you can ligate them in most cases. And then uh, we, we take out some of the vertebral body tumor and ultimately the goal is to find the posterior longitudinal ligament and cut it across the anterior dura to affect a margin uh, anteriorly uh, 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 to circumferentially decompress the patient. And so what we did was we took this really high grade cord compression. We simply did separation surgery to strip the tumor and the PLL off of the dura to reconstitute the fecal sac. We basically, in this case, left all this tumor behind because we didn't think we could resect it and we didn't think it would impact local tumor control. We did two level above and below fixation. We reconstituted the fecal sac. We gave eight grade times three. Patients fully ambulatory two years out. We gave her a surgery that she could tolerate. And then we relied on the radio surgery to get local tumor control. In terms of this approach of separation surgery, 75% of our non-ambulatory patients regain the ability to walk and overall 90% are ambulatory. In terms of patient reported outcomes for this type of surgery, both in terms of brief pain inventory and medassi uh, symptom inventory, patients improve both in terms of pain and general activity uh, with this type of surgery. What do we know about tumor control with conventional external beam radiation after surgery? Well, it turns out that in all the literature that was written, only one patient series followed uh, patients longitudinally. Um, Clay Camp Sammy, it was published in 1998. They did very aggressive, either partial or complete resections on all patients uh, with conventional external beam radiation as adjuvant. And despite this really aggressive surgery, 
local control at a year was only 30%. If patients live long enough, virtually everybody recurred. And the most significant predictor of recurrence was tumor histology, right? If you had radioresistant tumor histology, you weren't gonna get any better control in the post-operative setting than you did in the upfront setting, no matter how much tumor you took out. Here's our series of this really simple separation surgery followed by radio surgery in 186 patients. Most were operated for high-grade cord compression with radio-resistant tumor histologies and 50% had failed prior radiation. Three-dose strategies, high-dose single fraction, high-dose hypofractionated, and low-dose hypofractionated. The one-year cumulative instance of recurrence was 16%, so significantly better than the 70% they saw using conventional external beam radiation as a post-operative adjuvant. But if we gave a high enough dose single or high-dose hypofractionated radiation, we had less than 10% recurrence at a year, and that uh, durability was fairly uh, long-lasting. So we got durable control with stereotactic radio surgery uh, with a very simple uh, post decompression fixation. And again, in this series, we overcame radio-resistant tumor histologies with high-dose perfraction radiation, in this case, as a post-operative adjuvant. What has changed about radio surgery is really more on the instrumentation than the decompressive side for the most part. Traditionally, again, we've gone long segment fixation, uh, trying to overcome two issues uh, in, that are ubiquitous in the cancer population. One is you can almost expect that most patients are gonna be osteoporotic. And so by distributing the load with long, long uh, segment fixation, we overcome that. And then very often when patients progress disease, it's at the adjacent segment. So that if all of your hardware is at adjacent segment, there's a good probability you're gonna lose fixation. And so traditionally we've gone minimum two above, two below the index level. With the integration of fenestrated pedicle screws, which are cement augmented, uh, and this really started with our, uh, not our separation surgery, but really patients who were uh, being instrumented for instability alone, but we realized that those patients were holding up pretty well. And so in the last two or three years, we've really gone to this very short segment fixation, not two above, two below, but single level above and below the index level with cement augmentation. Again, which may overcome both of those issues of osteoporosis uh, and adjacent segment progression. Um, in terms of our long construct failures, uh, we looked at 318 patients. The fixation failure rate was 2.8%. Um, so even in the cancer population, this is a very good construct. I think there was a lot of criticism early on that if we didn't reconstruct the anterior column formally, the patients would fall apart. And point of fact, if we take out more than 50% of the radial body, we do an open cement augmentation of the index level with uh, uh, vertebroplasty. Uh, but realistically, that strategy has worked very well in the cancer population. When we switch to, again, this short segment with PMMA augmented pedicle screws, we've recently looked at 44 patients. Um, and it turns out that the fixation failure rates are very similar, about two, two and a half percent. We did have some asymptomatic issues with haloing and progressive fracture that did not require a reinstrumentation, but we think this shorter segment fixation will reduce the morbidity associated with this surgery even further. And um, think that this may be a very effective strategy in this population. More recently, we have been doing more minimally invasive decompressions with tubular retractors. I think there may be some benefit to this, although I think this is uh, incremental and not really an exponential development. Uh, but certainly if you're comfortable with tube decompressions, uh, it is not um, an unreasonable thing to do to get off the midline and put these incisions uh, 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 unilaterally through the muscle. Uh, to see if you can impact uh, uh, both quality of life uh, and recovery after surgery. Ultimately, I think this is probably, if you're comfortable, do it. If not, it's probably not um, significant enough to make you want to learn this procedure for cancer alone. And in terms of the mental access surgery uh, for this patient population, both again, in terms of BPI and Medastia, a significant improvement in pain and quality of life. Um, based on our experience with transfer animal endoscopic disc uh, surgery, we have started using endoscope, uh, endoscope now for tumor resection. Um, I think it's got limited utility uh, as of yet, but it's an interesting because so many of these tumors could be approached via the, the foramen to do an epidural decompression, particularly in the lumbar spine. 
Here's a case that Ori Barzilla, my uh, partner did, who was really superb in the endoscope of an osteoblastoma adjacent to the pars and facet joint that they did fully endoscopically and resected this. And again, I think for these benign tumors that are in this area, it may be really reasonable and interesting exploration and we're moving towards epidural decompression, but certainly not there yet. The other uh, endoscopic uh, approach is with the da Vinci robot. And while we're not there for metastatic disease yet, it is a very effective strategy for paraspinal benign neurogenic tumors, such as schwannomas uh, and ganglion neuromas. Uh, and we're now incorporating this. Uh, Ori, again, Barzillai, who is our, our partner, has learned the endoscopic technique. We do it in conjunction with access surgeons, but actually it, the, the visibility, the degrees of freedom on these arms make it a very useful uh, tool for these resections. And we've now done about 12. Here's a presacral tumor that you can see here that was resected with da Vinci. And this was the first case we did of an apical schwannoma uh, predicated on the T2 nerve root that was fully resected with uh, the da Vinci robot. So it's an interesting application that we're beginning to explore. I think there might be an application for metastatic disease, particularly as we develop or as, uh, as the company allows us to develop drills uh, that can go through uh, that can be attached to robotic arms, but we're not quite there yet. So we go back to that 66 year old male with a history of renal cell carcinoma with this biologic back pain, uh, uh, three out of five in the lower extremities and medical issues and some systemic issues that impact what we're gonna do. Uh, this very high grade core compression um, at T10. And we go through our GNOMES framework for somebody who's in Asia C with high grade cord compression renal cell, which is markedly resistant to conventional external beam radiation, the SIN score here uh, is four, so they're stable. It doesn't really come into play in terms of our decision making. And we're cleared medically and from a systemic disease standpoint to take them to surgery. And so that becomes non contributory. And so the best solution for this renal cell would be to put them on high dose steroids, embolize, and then take them for really separate, simple separation surgery followed by radio surgery to get local tumor control. If we make this high-grade cord compression now with an Asia C lymphoma, really incredibly radiosensitive tumor, mechanically stable. Again, we don't need to stabilize uh, for this patient and the stem disease and medical comorbidities will allow us to do anything. This is probably better for high-dose steroids and then simply taking them to conventional external beam radiation again, with the expectation that tumor will apoptose and decompress the spinal cord. And again, if you're gonna do this, uh, please admit them to the hospital to make sure they don't decompensate, that they need to go to surgery. But typically these patients will do very well with high dose steroids and radiation alone. And then it's that patient who comes in myelopathic with high grade cord compression to your emergency room with no preceding history of cancer and no known diagnosis. And again, in this patient population who is neurologically impaired, we don't want them to fall off the cliff. And so typically we will take that patient for simple separation surgery and then follow them up with whatever adjuvant uh, is most appropriate. But again, even if this is myeloma lymphoma, you don't want that patient to neurologically decompensate while you're waiting for a diagnosis to decide whether it's radiosensitive or not. Simply take them to surgery get them out of trouble and then get them to appropriate therapy. So here's a patient that we saw um, two weeks ago that got sent in from the radiation oncologist in the network, 48 year old cholangiocarcinoma with biologic back pain, a T12 lesion that's an ESCC1B. And I think the radiation oncologist out in the network would say it's an ESCC1B um, that's a radio surgery target without decompression, I can treat this. But the radiation oncologists um, who are really aware of gnomes and this bigger picture with a cancer patient said, you know what, it's not just biologic pain, it's both mechanical and oncologic. It's worse at night, so he's telling us that's his biologic or tumor-related pain, but it's also exacerbated by transition from lying, sitting, and standing. It's worth with extended periods of activity like walking, uh, and that's the point in his story where he's telling us, I think he's mechanically unstable. If you look at his imaging on CT scan, it's pretty clear why that is. This is a thoracolumbar burst fracture with posterior element disease. And if we do our SIN score, it's 13. The radiation oncologist didn't need to know the SIN score. All they needed to know that there was a significant amount of movement related pain that was not 
simply the tumor being there, that biologic pain, it was really something greater than that. Oftentimes when the SIN score uh, falls into that seven to 10 range, uh, they often have a burst or compression fracture that's symptomatic. And many of those patients, thoracolumbar, can be treated with simple kyphovertebroplasty. There is class one evidence that in the cancer population, uh, the kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty are very meaningful with significant pain improvement that is durable compared to non-operative management. And so for those patients seven to 10 with severe pain uh, with a burst or compression fracture, uh, definitely consider kyphovertebroplasty. It turns out that when you have a burst or compression fracture that's symptomatic, an extension into the posterior element, when your SIN score gets up into that 13 to 17 range, it often denotes that there's a fracture like this, a burst or compression fracture, with extension into the posterior elements. And our experience is that you cannot simply put, do a vertebroplasty for this fracture. You have to give them a posterior tension band uh, to augment that uh, vertebro or kyphoplasty. Uh, it's this posterior element disease that you need to stabilize across. And so for these patients, we've been doing percutaneous pedicle screws, fenestrated PMA delivery in, into the uh, instrumented levels and then cement augmentation at the index levels. Here, there was a fracture additionally at the level below that was treated with a simple kyphoplasty, but uh, you cannot simply treat a burst or compression fracture with post element disease with kypho alone. You need to give them a posterior tension band. And that, uh, we looked at 46 patients who fell into that category. And again, we take patients from really severe or moderate pain to mild or none in most patients. There is a, um, a um, syndrome in cancer that falls into the sort of indeterminate category that you would expect to be able to do kyphovertebroplasty with, with the SIN score of eight. And that's what we call mechanical radiculopathy. It's axial load pain that causes uh, both back and leg pain. And it's not so much that uh, it's the fracture issue in the bone here. It's often that the pedicle is fractured off the bone. And when they actually load, the neuroframe and closes down the nerve root causing severe radiculopathy. And there's simply no way to get rid of that pain unless you actually decompress the nerve root, which typically means taking out the pedicle joint uh, and then doing a supplemental fixation above and below. More often than not now for this specific indication, we are using percutaneous pedicle screws with cement augmentation and then doing a tubular resection of the facet joint and pedicle to open up that neural frame. And, uh, and in this series of patients with mechanical radiculopathy, pain improved in 98%. Again, VAS went from an eight to a two, and the vast majority of our patients ended up with ECOG greater uh, than 90, uh, um, uh, ECOG zero to two and greater than 90%. Um, and then there are patients with, like this, who have a fracture subluxation at C1, C2, who really need an open surgery and occipital cervical uh, fixation. Uh, and so there's still a role for open surgery, although the vast majority of instability alone could be treated with either a cement augmentation or cement augmentation with percutaneous pedicle screws. And then the last issue you have to worry about is if you're gonna take them to surgery, does it make sense in the context of their disease? And do, are they gonna be able to tolerate what you propose. And again, I think that the Tamina and Takahashi scores have been used for decades to determine what kind of treatment somebody should need and whether they were candidates for surgery. In the era of the biologic and checkpoint inhibitors, uh, there are new uh, predictive models. This is a SORG nomogram from Harvard, uh, which uses things that are very commonly found in the medical uh, workup, uh, including a performance, ECOG performance scale. Uh, that will predict survival based on these uh, metrics. And that's uh, been validated in external validation at our institution. Um, and then the other thing that um, is really important is whether they're just simply medically able to tolerate uh, whatever the proposed procedure is. Um, there are a number of indices that have been developed. This is uh, the MSTFI frailty index, which again uses things that are very easily found in the medical record to determine what uh, the probability of either a complication or mortality from the surgery is. And I think in the areas of biologic and checkpoint inhibitors where medical oncologists used to be so negative about taking anybody to surgery and not wrongly, 
But now that they have all of this treatment to offer, they often want patients fixed and back to medical therapy. And then you look at the patient and you say, well, they're just too sick for that operation. I can't do that for you. And yet they push you to do it anyway. Now you have an index that will say, you know what? We really are falling into this category where we don't think that patient's gonna to tolerate surgery. Um, and I don't think that's the right thing to do, but you need something uh, as an objective metric to be able to say, just you know, not, not the right candidate to go through this. So again, at least as it stands today, the GNOMES framework uh, for patients with radiosensitive tumors, regardless of degree of cord compression, we most often will treat them with conventional external beam radiation. The exception is breast and prostate with myelopathy will often go to surgery. If we have radio resistant tumor with minimal or no cord compression, now up to grade twos, we're now treating with radio surgery alone. For radio resistant tumors with high grade cord compression, we can't conform the beams tight enough to spare spinal cord tolerance. But we now go to this really simple separation surgery followed by radio surgery to get local tumor control. Mechanical instability is a separate assessment based on the SIMS criteria. Once a patient is deemed unstable, they typically need a stabilization procedure, again, either vertebrokyphoplasty, perk screws are open. And then everything is really predicated on what they can tolerate from a systemic disease standpoint. Are, does it actually make sense in the context of the disease? And if I'm gonna take them to surgery, are their lungs good enough? Is their heart good enough? Uh, to take that proposed uh, procedure. Uh, the worst thing in the world is to take somebody um, who's really sick uh, and has other uh, comorbidities and would never get benefit from the surgery, take them to surgery and then have them la um, live the rest of their life in the hospital and not being able to get out. They could have had meaningful survival even if they had neurologic injury versus trying to recover from a surgery that was never gonna be meaningful. And so you have to figure out how to to, uh, to look at those uh, criteria and, and, um, and, and make that as part of your assessment. Thank you very much. Dr. Bilski, thank you for such an amazing presentation. There's an innovative topic and always is amazing all the things that you're doing over there in this loan. We have a few questions from the public and I'm going to read to you. Uh, Dr. Paulo Fernandez Sanchez asks, thank you, Dr. Belsky, wonderful lecture. What strategy will you recommend for low income countries where stereotypic uh, radio surgery is not available? Yeah, I, I think the GNOMES framework that I presented is how we populated it at our institution. I think the value of GNOMES is not fully that you have to have radio surgery. It's if you have radio surgery, this is how you do it. I think what happens is if you have high grade spinal cord compression from a radio resistant tumor, I would absolutely be more aggressive with the surgery in terms of site reduction time to take more surgery out, giving them more room, uh, give them conventional external beam radiation as a post-operative adjuvant. Um, um, it's not that it's bad, it's good. And I think site reduction and more distance from the cord is good. The problem is the biology of the tumor is gonna predict the recurrence. So it still may not give you durable control, but um, it is the best you can do. And I absolutely, if I didn't have radio surgery, I would go back to what we did in the old days, which was being much more aggressive with tumor resection um, with the hope that it would give you a more durable control and less chance of having a re uh, the tumor grow back into the spinal cord space and, and, and give you myelopathy. Thank you, Professor. There's another question from Dr. Beltran. Thanks for an excellent presentation. There is a metastasis resistant to radio surgery. Thank you. Um, honestly, the best we can tell the answer is no, but I think it's a relative um, you know, it's so much better than conventional. I think if we were going to pull out a tumor that doesn't respond as well, uh, it's probably colon. Uh, and the reason is probably that a lot of the radiobiology of radiosurgery is predicated on, um, on um, impacting the, the blood vessel cells, this endothelial apoptosis. It's sort of a unique mechanism of radiobiology. And colon cancer is usually very, um, uh, it doesn't have a lot of blood supply. It's pretty avascular. And so we may not be getting that additional impact 
that we get in something like a renal or a melanoma where they're really highly vascular. I think one of the more interesting things is, is that, you know, chordoma, for instance, has been considered so radio resistant, but the reality is it's probably no more or less radio resistant than any other solid tumor. And so I don't show you that data. And perhaps in a later lecture, I'll show you how we're starting to look at chordoma in a different way. You know, this primary tumor that's been sort of mythically on block resected, trying to get wide margins. The reality is for most of our patients, especially with high grade core compression, where we don't have a target, we're now doing just simple separation surgery with radio surgery and our local control uh, at five years now is about 92%. So you can start to incorporate this for every radio resistant tumor histology. I would say we're 98% on colon cancer, for instance, we're probably 92, per, yeah, 98% with every tumor histology across, we're probably 92%. It's still better, but that's the one tumor that drives us crazy because that's the one that you'll see recur when none of the other ones do. Thank you, Professor. Matthew Berchak asks, in 2021, is there any indication for in-block resection for spinal metastasis? Um, if you have radio surgery, I think the answer is no. Uh, if you have a young, healthy patient and no access to radio surgery, I think the answer might be yes. The local control relative to intralesional resection for those patients who are truly candidates for a marginal or wide on block resection is still going to be better than intralesional, but it's probably not as good, as best we can tell, as radio surgery alone. Um, so I think in principle, the answer is no, if you have access to good radio surgery. Thank you, Professor. Given the upcoming, well, the um, framework of none that you have described in the last years, do you think it's there is an additional role of Tomita's score or is it just a score that we should uh, forget? Or? I, I think it was developed in the days before um, effective radiation. I think it was really incredibly meaningful um, when it was developed. The fact that they haven't been able to incorporate effective radiation and then it, the survival um, histologies are based on pre um, biologics and checkpoint inhibitors, which have really been incredibly impactful, makes it less useful. Um, I think if you're in a community where, again, there's not a big use of those um, um, biologics and such, and you don't have radio surgery, it's still, you know, you're, it's still meaningful. I think realistically, once you get advanced technology, and it, it's probably a little antiquated, if you look at the survival curves that they develop, they are not nearly as predictive as things like SORG and there's a New England spine metastasis score um, that are much more predictive, but they were developed again when we had all these newer agents. Thank you, Professor. We have another question from the public. How long, how long after surgery do you start radiosurgery Sur or conventional radiotherapy? Uh, conventional will typically, if possible, wait three to four weeks. For radio surgery, most of our patients are now um, getting it within 10 days to two weeks. So, um, you know, the beams are brought in from a lot of different trajectories, so they don't go straight through your wound. And so there's, there's really not a penalty for irradiating early. Um, and for some tumors like prostate, hormone refractory prostate, um, if you don't get them irradiated within a month, the tumor is back and worse. And so, um, you know, for some of these tumor styles that are really aggressive, it does matter when you get the post-op dose in. Okay, thank you, Professor. Francisco Perez asks, thank you, Dr. Bolski. In a patient with sarcoma who was treated with surgery plus radiosurgery, and then was documented a growth tumor, radiosurgery alone management will be an option? I think if you have a target, I think um, if you have a target for radiation um, and no spinal cord compression, it is very reasonable to re-irradiate because ultimately, again, I don't think surgery for recurrent sarcoma is going to be any better the second time than it was the upfront time. And so, you know, it may have been a targeting issue that you had with the radiation that you weren't quite wide enough and didn't cover microscopic. It may have been that your dose wasn't high enough, but you can certainly re-irradiate. 
um, sometimes will go from you know radio surgery to protons at recurrence for cordo for uh, sarcoma, but I think ultimately um, I don't know that there's a huge amount of value in in reoperating if you have a target for radiation. The other thing, just as a, a quick aside, you know, we put cordoma sort of in that category too, and it turns out that um, cordoma has a lot of PDL1 receptors. Uh, which again are very amenable to checkpoint inhibitors. It's not a very immunogenic tumor, but it's got a lot of the receptors that uh, are targeted by like nivolumab or, or uh, uh, pembrolizumab. And so we now have um, protocols for recurrent, particularly cordoma, to use combination radiosurgery and, and checkpoint inhibitors, trying to again sort of augment that effect of the radiation with uh, T cell immunity. And uh, we had some pretty good results. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more combination therapy in recurrent tumor, whether it's sarcoma uh, or cordoma or, you know, metastatic disease. We just did a third time renal cell recurrence in the epidural space and definitely could not give an ablative dose uh, third. And, uh, you know, we did combination Nevo, SBRT, um, and um, looks like you got pretty good necrosis in the tumor, you know, for a dose that we wouldn't have anticipated would have worked third time around. So I think that's where we're probably going with recurrences is trying to do more combination therapy. Okay, Professor, thank you. And regarding the brachytherapy that you mentioned, uh, what, will, what features or characteristics or criteria will make us choose brachytherapy over radiosurgery or other conventional radiotherapy? That's a great question. For um, it was never it was never one versus the other for us. It was really um, used as an adjunct. So we had we developed these P thirty two plaques, which was really the brainchild of Josh Yamada. P thirty two was approved for neural use, so we didn't have to get approval for it, and we just put it in a really thin plastic polymer. And it turned out that the old radio surgery, the, the initial IMRT machines, were really good at making concave shapes, but it was very difficult to treat circumferential tumor all the way around the dura. And so what we would often do is take out the epidural tumor and then lay a P32 plaque on the back of the dura to clear that dural margin and then effectively treat that concave shape with SBRT. With volumetric arc therapy, it's much easier to do a circumferential plan. So we don't use them nearly as much um, as we used to. And, uh, and then the company had some problems with manufacturing, so we don't exactly have them now. There are other uh, beta emitting radioisotopes, which again, give these really high dose delivery, but it doesn't penetrate. So it's sort of tailor-made for, for dural plaques. Um, the iridium afterloaded catheters for recurrent bone disease, it just turns out that, you know, we can almost always give an ablative dose to the bone. So we don't use them very much, but it, it is for, you know, if you have bone disease and you want to, uh, and you don't have radio surgery, but you have iridium, which is readily available in a lot of hospitals. Um, you can definitely treat bone disease. Um, you know, it's just, it's easier to target with SBRT than it is to get a good dose coverage with iridium. Thank you, Professor. I have another question from the public. Should, from Matthew Berchuk, should asymptomatic spinal meds be treated with radiation? That's a great question. Um, in principle, if patients are going to survive a long time and we know their systemic therapy isn't going to impact bone disease, we do treat asymptomatic lesions um, to get patients out of trouble, to prevent patients from getting into trouble from things that we predict are going to progress um, uh, with an extended survival. So I think there is that category of patient that we absolutely treat with radio surgery, they're asymptomatic. The second clearly is gonna be a paradigm shift across the world. It certainly has started to be integrated in Europe and will be, uh, I think, selectively in the United States, which is that oligomet, where you have one to five metastases and giving ablative radiation to asymptomatic lesions impacts overall survival. Um, I think those are the patients that you're gonna to start to see um, are gonna be aggressively treated with radiation, even though they're not symptomatic, but trying to you know, induce this this survival benefit. Okay. But you you will wait to the primary tumor gets control before or just go with the radiation of the not necessarily. A lot of times we treat the metastatic disease even before the primary. And it used to be that if you had metastatic disease, oftentimes they, they wouldn't treat the primary at all. 
Okay. Uh, you know, from a symptomatic standpoint, it's much more important potentially to irradiate a spine metastasis and, and prevent people from getting into trouble in that regard than to treat, you know, a renal cell lesion, which isn't a renal primary, which isn't really going to do anything other than impact you know, a little bit of pain, you know, that kind of thing. So a lot of times they would never treat, they don't only treat the metastatic disease. Now, again, there's a survival benefit to treating the primary site. So they often will do that, but, but it's not unusual to treat MET first. Thank you, Professor. And the last question from the public, for which tumors do you recommend particle therapy? Um, I, well, I think the, so sarcoma, primary sarcoma, and even chordoma to date, the biggest data and literature is on particle therapy. So either protons or carbon ions. So I think realistically, those are still recommended for that. Um, for metastatic disease, uh, um, you know, th there's been advances in protons with pencil beam delivery. So they're beginning to do hypofractionated radiation, but realistically, you know, they're using conventionally fractionated two gray per fraction. The benefit in protons is they can go to 60 to 70 gray above spinal cord tolerance, but that means it's six to eight weeks of radiation. And you're typically not going to do that for metastatic disease. So at least to date, unless they're going to do hypofractionated radiation, one to three fractions with protons, which is the next kind of iteration of protons, um, there's probably no benefit in metastases with the exception of people who've been multiply treated and then you're trying to spare their colon or their bowel that's already gotten a meaningful dose of radiation. And those are the patients who, you know, third time of radiation and too many organs at risk have already gotten, you know, hit that will go to protons for uh, metastatic disease and long-term survivors. But the, the timing of that radiation is just prohibitive for METs. Professor, on behalf of the CN, I would like, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Bilski. My privilege. Because this has been a wonderful lecture. We're really grateful and honored for your participation this year in the IWBNC. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to be with you. Yes, you all will be welcome here. Thank you. For all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on the website starting next, next week. In a few minutes, we will have Paul Park, Dr. Paul Park doing his lecture, The Impact of Enabled Technologies on Minimally Invasive Spinal Surgery. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow up the link pin on the chat screen or check the program schedule on your website, signhus.com.